welcome to our session, our panel on uh, large language models and the role of data in training and tuning large language models. Uh, my name is Ali Arsenjani, and uh, we have a very illustrious panel today of partners. Uh, I lead Google's AIML partner engineering and uh, very happy that you can join us here today. So I'm gonna go around and have our panelists introduce themselves, uh, starting with yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Paroma, I'm one of the co-founders at Snorkel AI and really excited for the discussion today. Hi, my name is Ben Vlast. I'm a product manager at MongoDB, uh, focused on AI and ML and vectors. Uh, hello, everyone. Zaid Hasbe. I'm uh, Chief Product Officer for Neo4j. This is you. We have uh, companies like Neo4j, MongoDB, and Snorkel AI here with us, our partners in our expanding ecosystem of developing generative AI applications and AI ML applications in general. So um, one of the things I wanted to ask you all today is what are the use cases that you're seeing uh, that's resonating with your customers? And uh, what, what is the uptick? What are the key use cases? Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Sudhir. This time. Okay, thanks, Ali, for the question. And uh, so uh, I'm part of Neo4j. Neo4j is a graph analytics and database company. Uh, organization use us for organizing their knowledge uh, into knowledge graphs in form of entities and relationships and how to bring all of these technologies together. And as we see generative AI uh, capabilities mature, one of the things organizations want to do is, one, democratize access to all of the data that is available, the relationships and the information that's there in the enterprise. So for example, uh, one of the things that our customers use us for is, uh, you know, customer journey on their websites, like how does a customer come to the website, how do they traverse through what they have done, and a lot of times there are a lot of questions that need to be asked about why did this person come and did not complete the transaction in the cart or something like that. And today what happens is the access to that kind of technology is limited to experts who can work with the data, who can write some complex queries and all, and so this, there is a whole move to can we democratize access to that using large language models, more natural language experience on it. Another great example is we are working with large pharmaceutical uh, company. They have a complex supply chain, and so they represent their whole supply chain as a digital twin in form of a graph. And then, like in Florida, what happens if hurricane comes? What would be the impact of that if, like, let's say, uh, you are unable to go and fulfill from that distribution center for two to three days? What should we do? So those are the kinds of questions you can uh, ask. Now, there are 300 people who can actually go traverse a graph and actually use graph tools, but with large language models and uh, like, you know, natural language, we can extend it to thousands of people in the organization. Those are a couple of examples of what, uh, what we are seeing in the, uh, in the industry. Those use cases, that's awesome. Um, uh, that's for Neo4j, knowledge graphs, and uh, its relationship to large language models. Ben. Sure. So, um I work at MongoDB and we have uh, Atlas, the developer data platform. And you know our whole purpose is to make it as easy as possible for developers to build applications. Um, and there are obviously a lot of new uh, generative tools in the space and we're looking to make it easier and easier to consume those. Um, the kind of key use cases that we're seeing right now are focused around RAG architectures, right? Kind of bringing in context learning um, so that you can build chatbots and support utilities. We're also seeing a lot of uh, natural language generation that re relies on some corpus of private or sensitive data. Uh, and then we see, you know, generative technologies and, and kind of advanced embedding models bringing about kind of uh, improvements in recommendation systems and anomaly detection. And so we're seeing a wide range of, of those use cases. For, you know, RAG architectures, we see a lot of chatbots, you know, large insurance companies wanting to vectorize their knowledge corpus and have either their support systems or, you know, something that a customer can interact with directly use them. We also see a lot of kind of specialized content generation. So 
something you would in the past have to have an expert fill out a form. Now you can have an expert use a tool to pre-fill a form uh, based on some corpus of information that gets fed into a large, la large language model. Um, and then some really interesting things around anomaly detection, uh, like detecting if a car is having a problem based on you know matching the signal of its engine to, to others. And then just personally, uh, you know, the headshot up there was generated uh, with uh, generative technology because I didn't have one. So that was my personal <laughs> use case. It's a good one. I was about to mention that because you told me if you didn't mention it yourself. Um, uh, so a little bit about Snorkel. Snorkel is a data-centric AI development platform. What that means is we help you develop your data, label your data programmatically, allowing you to do this, you know, 100 to 1,000 times faster than manually labeling your data, train a model, analyze where it's going right, where it's going wrong, and then iterate and uh, correct the data that you have to get the best performance out of your model. So in terms of the use cases that we're seeing, I'll actually split my answer into two large buckets. Um, one really interesting one that we've been seeing and working with customers on is this idea of building your own large language model, kind of making it customized given all the data that various enterprises have. Um, you know, something that, that's become really popular now because you have all these large language models that are so extremely powerful, the kind of major way that enterprises are differentiating themselves and kind of getting an edge over each other is the data. It's the data that they own. That's what lets you really own that your model model, you know, customize it uh, based on what you have access to. So people are building out, you know, something, I've heard this term, GPTU, making a large language model that they can then use as a basis for all the various downstream tasks that you're interested in. In terms of the downstream tasks, you know, we've worked on a variety of use cases across a range of verticals. A um, couple of the financial institutions we work with, you know, five of the top 10 US banks, they're using Snorkel, and again, focusing on that data piece, right, the, the part that they really own and can customize to do um, analyzing reports, detect fraud. In the life sciences space, we've seen things like doing clinical trial analysis and you know, using that to improve demographics for trials that are being run, which has become a really important topic recently. And then finally, in the insurance space, we've seen people be able to, again, focus on that data center way of developing their data to create a model and you know cut down on claims analysis time by up to 50 percent um, so this combination of using your data to build models for a very specific downstream tasks as well as these generalized custom large language models for enterprises super exciting to see what's happening in that space excellent thank you um, yeah and just one more thing to add right I think one of the other advantages that we are seeing is this combination of structured and unstructured data. We've been talking about it for a very long time, but how do you blend these things into a single information set and do discovery across it? We call it implicit and explicit. Implicit is where you know the structure, you know the relationships, and unstructured is I have parts manual sitting across the whole company in PDF form. How do you take those and also like you know store it as vectors and have the relationships mentioned? So now you can do a discovery of, hey, tell me everything about a part that looks like this and this has this kind of a description, and you can do a discovery across the vectorized search plus the uh, relationships that are maintained in the database. So I think those combinations of that, we're seeing that in oil and gas, we see that in uh, some of the large manufacturers for federal government with for missions and stuff like that where you have massive amounts of parts that go into building uh, like, you know, single product and stuff like that. That's that makes example. a lot of sense. You know, combining the unstructured and structured, the implicit and explicit, as you termed it, makes a lot of sense to combine them together because the information is spread across the enterprise. So I, I want to uh, uh, then mention one thing. Uh, how many people have heard of RAG? Raise your hand. Okay, fantastic. That's excellent. So uh, I didn't hear it. Uh, I thought you might have heard it incorrectly. It's not RAD, it's RAG. I'm kidding. <laughs> And so with retrieval augmented generation, how many people are using, are you using retrieval augmented generation? Raise your hand. Very good. Uh, it's, 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 in, it's increasing. Everybody's aware of it. That's the first step. But, you know, maybe 15% uh, are actually using it. That's, that's really good. Now, across the life cycle for uh, building or leveraging generative AI, whether you want to customize a model uh, or leverage the data that you have, on Google Cloud, your data is your data. 
It's not going to go anywhere else. It's not going to get leaked out. Uh, data models and embeddings and code are preserved within the secure enclave of your cloud environment. And when we interact across the life cycle, you will have very specific needs to interact with Google's partners, potentially, uh, for various uh, types of things. You may want to create a knowledge graph, go to Neo4j. You may want to vectorize the data you have to combine the structured and unstructured. Go to MongoDB, for example. And then if you want to prepare your data for tuning and uh, creating domain-specific models, we have Snorkel AI. So, but along this journey, there are challenges. And I want to tap into the expertise I have here on this panel uh, to tell us what your experiences are in terms of the challenges and difficulties that you're seeing your customers are experiencing. This time I'm going to start with Barbara. Barbara, go ahead. Yeah. Um, all my answers are going to start with this two-part split. but. You know, again, being in a space where we're seeing people really focus on the data to build out their models, there's two broad questions that we see come up from our customers that we talk to. One is, what data do I use, right? Um, you have these generalized models. There's, they've been trained on some amount of data that's out there. Is that the correct type of data you want to use for your kind of enterprise production level use case? Do you need to edit it? Do you need to check you know, how it's performing on your specific tasks? Um, do you want to customize it, again, on the data that belongs to your enterprise? Another place where data actually has a big role to play is evaluation. Um, I think something we've seen a lot with these generative AI models is these really nice demos, right? You see these demos, you upload one PDF or two PDF, and it, it looks great. It's amazing. It does perfect. Now scale that to a million documents, scale that to 10 million documents. How do you know it's going to do well on each and every single one of those? One option is to, you know, you go ahead and label 10 million documents. That's not feasible. So you have to be smart about how you're using your data for this evaluation piece as well. Another thing that's come up is this, this idea of bias. If you don't have full insight into the data that these models are getting trained on, you don't have a sense of, you know, whether your model might be biased or not. Um, you know, there are parts. There's things that the model has learned that you might not want to kind of pass on to your end users and your own customers. So that question of what is the data, whether it's for evaluation purposes, for training purposes, and how knowledge from that data is affecting your use cases where you're using generative AI, that's a really big open question and I think a challenge that, that we'll see as people start using generative for production use cases. Um, one more is how do you leverage, and you know, especially what Sudhir and Ben were saying, how do you leverage all these different techniques that are available to kind of push your knowledge into these models? There's ragging, structured data, unstructured your data, prompting, fine tuning. How do you know which kind of method to use um, when you're working with your data and when you're working with your models? And how do you do that efficiently? You don't want to do this in a whack-a-mole manner, right? Like pick one, okay, let me try it for two hours, didn't work, let me try another one, let me go back. So what we're doing at Snorkel is really making that process much more guided, much more efficient to, to make it a lot more structured for our data scientists and our um, domain experts to be able to build these models. Excellent. Uh, on, on the data side, uh, on the beginning of the life cycle, when you're curating and preparing data, there's so many concerns, right? You, you know, you mentioned bias in the data, you mentioned skew in the data, potentially what's the distribution of data that you need, and ultimately, um, is the data credible, right? Is it grounded in factuality? So factual grounding is another key thing. Uh, go ahead, Ben. Uh, sure, yeah, so I think, you know, from Speaking to a ton of my customers, I would say the problems that I hear the most break into, into really two groups. One is, is knowledge and the other is tools. And so the first is knowledge. A lot of people don't know, you know what's possible. With you know, these foundational models that have come out, I'll, almost you know, every engineer is being asked to build something inside of a domain that you know, they weren't in you know, just six months ago. And now everyone you know, has to have kind of AI capabilities. And so, Knowing what, what can be done um, and what should be done is definitely uh, a challenge. The, the other bit about that is then all of the techniques and um, kind of concepts that you need to understand in order to do a lot of this work. So for retrieval augmented generation, you know, how do you chunk your data? Um, 
you know, what is going to give you a very good uh, response back to then include in the context that you provide to your large language model? These are, you know, really challenging, um, you know, obstacles to get through in order to deliver a, an excellent user experience. And kind of just alongside that is the tools bit. And so tools, there's all different types of security and compliance concerns. And, you know, that's one of the things that we're kind of eagerly interested in from a MongoDB perspective, which is how can we make some of those things just go away and let developers build applications more seamlessly. And so that kind of very much evolves out of the, the developer data platform that we have. Um, but the reality is that there are new tools and you need to know about those new tools and you need to know how to use them. Um, you know, things for chunking, uh, you know, there are the new frameworks and libraries that are very popular, such as the Langchains and Llama indexes of the world that people are learning a lot of these concepts out of, and then in some cases putting to use, uh, and then needing to, again, kind of operationalize and, and, and use. And so those are kind of like the two groups of challenges that we see most frequently and what, you know, my customers are saying to me. Okay. Thank you, Ben. I agree with both of you, and I will just add a couple of other points. I think uh, number one is it's about grounding or hallucinations, right? So everybody is worried about what happens if the answer that is coming back from large language model inaccurate, and what do we do? How do we ground it? How do we make sure it's accurate? And this is where separation of concerns kicks in about what goes in large language model, what's going to stay in the knowledge base within your organization, are you going to ask LLM for a question's answer and then validate it? Are you going to go ahead and just basically use it for vectorization and then ask, get the actual facts directly from the knowledge base and then use large language model for more natural experiences? So that is the whole area and there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of open questions for, for customers. People are trying both different ways. We see in the phase one of this journey, I'm pretty sure innovation in this space is going to only grow faster and faster, but in this phase, I see the separation of concerns and how you go ahead and do grounding better. So that's one area I think is there. The second area from a data perspective is the data in enterprises changes all the time. And training large language model on the fly is not possible. In the context of your prompt and the session, you can go ahead and have some level of information, but the facts are changing all the time. And so how do we make sure where you should do which decision making? And this is where we need better guidance for everybody. And from our perspective, it is how do you make like you know factual information versus natural language? So that is one area I think is is uh, is coming up again and again. And the third one I will talk about is there are a lot of organizations, and we work with some of the largest federal government departments and all that, and they have this air-gapped kind of an environment. And so in that scenario, then what model do I run, how do I run, how do I develop somewhere but not use the data that is there. And the, you mentioned about data security, your data is data. That is a big concern for everybody, and then how do we uh, solve for that together, I think uh, is going to be the th third one I will mention. Awesome. One, one area that, that I think, uh, don't forget what you are going to say, that, that I was going to ask Sudhir on is, so this, this confluence of knowledge graphs and LLMs, how does that look like? Yeah. Uh, what, 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 is, what is the... What is the promise of bringing large language models together with knowledge graphs? I think there are two aspects to that, right? One is, if you believe all your enterprise knowledge has been captured in a knowledge graph and where you know what the facts are and all, and you know large language models are great at generative languages, like, you know, I, I always talk about when you went to school, it was like English class and a math class. And math, I learned about, here's a formula, apply it this way, otherwise you're going to fail. And English was like, be more creative, and I have a tough time being creative. So, so I think those are two different ways of thinking, and I think, I think about large language model as a great way to continue teaching it, getting it better and better, but it is built for generating new information and new things out of the existing information. And then uh, knowledge graphs or knowledge bases are a great way of factual information. And the way they can come together is one, you can train models better when you know what your entities and relationships and what things are there. But also grounding, as I was saying, like making sure that you use the actual enterprise knowledge, which can be updated in real time and you can uh, keep everything current and that becomes your factual responses and all that. And I'm looking forward to more innovation in this place with lang chain around tooling and can you go ahead and integrate both of them more seamlessly and all that. But that's, I think, uh, better coming that's together. That's awesome, that's great. And spoiler alert, we have a blog on that you can, you can look up. <laughs>
Um, two things I wanted to double click into, I think on the topic of knowledge graphs and grounding, um, Ben actually called these models foundational models, right? And they're foundational for a reason. It's because they provide a really good basis, but you have to build on top of that, you know, pull in knowledge from these knowledge bases, knowledge graphs. Something that we've seen a lot of our customers do is use ontologies, especially in the medical field, right? So you have ontologies, you have these knowledge graphs, then you have just domain expertise. You know, we've had clinical research researchers use our platform uh, to build end-to-end -end AI applications. How do you combine all of that while taking advantage of everything that these large language foundational models give you is really important. The other point I wanted to double click into was adaptability, yeah. right? The amount of data that these models have been trained on, you cannot go back and change that uh, every time you have something new come up. Um, one of the banks that we worked with uh, during uh, COVID, you know, certain policies changed and they had to adapt their model. If they had gone back and just changed the data to fix their model, it would have been six months. In today's day, with the type of models we have, that's you're talking years, right? It's just not feasible. So having those efficient ways, like we've seen with Snorkel, to be able to adapt to changing business needs, to changing data distribution, skew, like you'd mentioned earlier, that becomes really, really critical in this time. That's really powerful. Yeah, one thing maybe just to add to this is, um, you know, something you just mentioned, Broma, about kind of adaptability is what we see as being really interesting with regards to some of the large language models is the fact that, you know, us as developers and builders want to expose new services and suites to all of our users, right? Um, but you're not going to take all of your users' data and train one model and turn it loose on all of your users, right? So, so it can tell, you know, me that I have blonde hair. That would be unhelpful. Um, and so what we see, you know, happening in the future is the use of databases with vector search to allow you to kind of personalize the responses from models in a very secure way, such that, you know, your session with this model can have context about you, but that model is only accessing that data within the context of the session within, within which you're interacting and never elsewhere, right? And so that also gets to the point of like where you want to think about kind of maybe fine tuning a model or making it better at handling some task but never, you know, releasing an individual's information inside of that and kind of, you know, kind of polluting those two different needs, which is really kind of one security and privacy and the other, you know, making something more performant for a certain set of tasks or characteristics. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think to kind of uh, draw a summary, if I were a long, large language model and you would prompt me for a summary of what you all said, <laughs> I would say that as an expert in knowledge graphs and vectorization and data preparation, there's this spectrum where you can do prompt engineering, it'll take you so far. Uh, you can do uh, retrieval augmented generation or its variations like flare, fetch, you know, look ahead. Um, by, by having a factual grounding in a knowledge graph that you look up at runtime, so to speak, before you give it to the model, you can have vectorized capabilities, as Ben was saying, where you've already created the embedding, stored the embedding, possibly combined the structured and unstructured data, so that when you're doing the retrieval, you can have access to that data. But all of these would be possible, if the next step would be if you fine tune a model. If you see this recurring over and over again on the same domain, it might make sense to fine tune the model as uh, Parma was mentioning, which is the ability to take that model and just teach it enough in that domain so that you're not completely doing a full fine tuning. You're either doing an adapter tuning, speaking of adapting, or doing something like a low rank adaptation capability where you're creating a smaller model that can satisfy your needs in the short term and you don't have to you know, shoulder the burden of a, of a large language model. That's where a cloud provider like Google can support you, but give you the ability to create those adapter models for your specific domains and then leverage the capabilities of our partners here at each stage across that spectrum. Did I capture that okay? Yeah. Okay. I'm just a large language model. <laughs> Very accurate. <laughs> so as you, as you take this journey forward in your products and your journey with your customers, what are, you, what are your plans or how are you today building on top of the Google uh, AI platform in order to accomplish your future 
uh, kind of needs. I'm going to start with Ben now, and then I, I'll, it's a 50-50 split who goes afterwards. That's very just of you. Um, yeah, so we're thrilled with everything that's coming out of Vertex AI. We're, you know, super excited about the model garden. For us, what's kind of, you know, closest is the new embedding models like Gecko, which are super exciting for us to use inside of our vector search offering. And so uh, we're going to plan, you know, deeper uh, and more easy to use integrations and kind of further enable our developers to take advantage of these new technologies. Uh, then large language models broadly. Um, you know, we want customers building applications. We see them kind of driving a lot of new applications being built on the platform. And so making it easier to consume those services, utilize, you know, Google's various uh, services inside of Vertex AI is kind of directly aligned with what we're trying to do. And so we see a journey, you know, starting with embeddings uh, and getting, you know, much deeper there and then moving into large language models and, and, and further. Awesome, thank you. Now. This is going to be a surprise to everyone. I'm going to give the audience a quiz, a very short quiz. <laughs> what is the new context window size that you can input into a Palm model? If it's, is it 4K? Raise your hands. Is it 8K? Raise your hands. Is it 32K? Raise your hands. You guys are awesome and fantastic. <laughs> it's 32K. Awesome. Very good. So are you guys, by the way. Uh, now, when something is output of a, of a large language model, uh, what about that token size? How many how many Ks of tokens? Is it 1K tokens? Is it 2K, 4K, or is it 8K tokens? 8K. Yes, it's 8K. Don't don't hesitate. We have 8K tokens coming out, uh, and that's sold to the gentleman from. Kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So we have 32K context windows, 8K outputs, uh, and hugely enhanced models that are being constantly updated. Now, with that, I'm going to go to Barman. Um, I, one of the things I was going to highlight was the inference piece that you had actually mentioned. You know, large language models are really great when you want to build a large number of kind of specialized uh, task-specific models on top. Some of the customers we've worked with, they just want, you know, one very specific use case. You don't need all the knowledge that's in these large language models. You don't want to bear the cost of kind of the inference and everything else that comes with it. So they've started distilling these models for just the knowledge that you need. And having, you know, Google AI and the integrations that we have has made that much simpler, right? It's, it's a one-click kind of process to go from tuning one of the largest models to then distilling it down and having that flexibility in the platform due to the integrations with Google has been amazing. Um, one very personal story I have to share is when we started with Snorkel, um, one of our first real use cases was with Google Ads. So this partnership has been there for decades now and something that's very, very close to our heart. You know, being able to see how real um, use cases were being built, you know, what the kind of pain alongside data, the data challenges back in those days were, and kind of really learning from that has been great. The last two things that I'll mention is, again, similar to what Ben says, the integration with Vertex AI, with BigQuery, that's been really great. And we also have someone uh, from our team actually integrating Palm as well, you know, and trying to see if we can take some of the prompting from Gen AI. So I know I'm, I'm going down the laundry list, but that's, that's really to say, you know, there's been so many products from within the Google space that have been so wonderful to integrate with and work with and something that our customers have, you know, repeatedly been really, really excited about. Awesome. Excellent. So before Sudhir goes, my second quiz of the day. Uh, so one of the problems that we have in large language models is they hallucinate. So the antidote, or at least the mitigating strategy for that is factual grounding. How do we do factual grounding on large language models? So you typically do some kind of a, you access it via knowledge graph, you access a vector database, you have a tune model, you go out and do retrieval augmented generation, but that factual grounding needs to be there. So today we announced how many types of new factual grounding? Is it one type of factual grounding or two types of factual grounding? Raise your hands, one or two? I feel like I'm at the eye doctor, is it one <laughs> or two? It's two types, thank you, you got it. Um, two types of factual grounding, one for enterprise search and another for a different capability that we have. So factual grounding is something that we need to 
leverage in terms of knowledge graphs, in terms of vector databases, in terms of the retrieval augmented generation that we have, so that we can ensure, or at least try to increase the probability that the data that's coming back from the large language model is credible data. Sudhir. Uh, so let me answer it in two or three phases. First one, super excited about the core data platform that Google has, the security, the governance, the VPC boundary, the AXT, all of that, because every enterprise I talk to, they're all about how do you secure my information? That's the biggest thing. The second is on the Vertex side, super excited about model garden because no one model is going to be perfect for every use case. Having this ability, and it was interesting to see the Llama model available, it was a great demo that uh, Nenshad did there. Uh, but I think that one having optionality is super important because we all have different needs and all. And then the, the app builder was super interesting. You can build a conversational uh, like an application pretty quickly. I think that's super helpful for us, our customers. So those are the three capabilities. The two different things, we think about how we will use uh, uh, like the Vertex AI capabilities for our own uh, product enhancements. And so in that, the biggest thing I'm excited about is we are looking at building our own uh, like you know, fine-tuned model uh, because we have our own language in, uh, in Neo4j, Cypher, many of the graph databases actually support Cypher as a primary language. It's similar to SQL, but more for graphs. Uh, but it is a different language, so having like uh, a customized model that is actually optimized for that, which we could open up to the whole industry, is a super exciting thing for us. So building on top of one of the either uh, code models that is available, Palm 2 maybe, or, or one of the other ones, like Llama code one that's available. So, so that is one area super excited, and then that augments into assisted development, how we can go ahead and do simplifying learning journeys for our developers and stuff like this. So that's one area. And then the second area for, for the enterprises where this is really relevant is how can we give more natural language chat experience more easily on, on their knowledge that they have created, so without them having to build the whole environment, train and fine tune and all that. So uh, I think one of the things we're excited to partner with Google is can we go ahead and take the knowledge graphs and like, you know, automatically create fine tuning on top of that so we can do that and then customize the models for them too. So, those are a couple of areas super excited on the where this thing is next. That's a very cutting edge set of innovations. That is awesome. Hey.